our ladies are a familiar sight in Worthing and have been for a very long time. Boots store is also a familiar sight, but a plaque reminds us of the fact that a church once stood in this place. The Literary Institute, as it was called, was the free church place of worship before Shelley Road Congregational Church opened. Mrs. Amy Pleasance, a member of Shelley Road since the 1930s and a long-time church secretary, talks to Bill Corey about the early days. You know people began talking of a church in West Worthing as early as 1934. Worthing well, must have been very different then from how it is today. Were you worshipping here then? Uh, yes, I joined the church though in 1933, but even then Worthing was quite different. You have been looking at some minutes of the deacons' meetings, I understand. Yes, shall we look at them? I'd love to do that. It must be most interesting. These notes here are from the Church Extension Subcommittee, dated May 1936. A lot of interest must have been shown in the Field Place estate. The bridge at Derrington had been built over the railway line and a new road was being constructed. The boulevard, I suppose, and finished in the spring of 1937, I see. We see here that a suggestion was made to secure not less than a half an acre plot of land for a church, church hall, manse, and parking area. Look at this, total cost of building, 2,400 pounds. <laughs> that wouldn't buy much today, would it? It certainly wouldn't. Mr. Ballard of Pevensey Road West Worthing, having written to complain of the distance of a congregational church from his place of residence, and to suggest that the matter of church extension might receive attention, it was agreed, on the motion of Miss Moorcraft, seconded by Mr Aldridge, that the secretary, together with Messrs Summers and Thompson, the Astrid The committee after very careful consideration and consultation with the adherents resident in the West Worthing area and Mr. Denman, architect, unanimously recommended that a dual purpose building combine church and lecture hall to seat 250 persons initially and to be adaptable to seat 350 ultimately. Mr. Marshall seconded a resolution that the report be accepted and presented to the church as a definite recommendation. This was agreed to without dissent. I went to Beckett Newspapers in Chatsworth Road to meet Mr. Harris. Yes, of the Herald and the Gazette that you were asking about. Perhaps you'd like to come and have a look at them, would you? Thank you. 
He was kind enough to show me the old Worthing newspapers, printed in the 1940s. I was looking for a mention of the beginnings of a church in Goring. It was interesting to read some of the other articles and advertisements of the time. A car could have been bought for £150. A bungalow for about £750. I continued to search through the large books, remembering again the heyday of the cinema and radio rental. Then, close to the picture of evacuees leaving Worthing, a short paragraph mentioning the first service to be held in Goring. The congregational church at Goring would have been completed by this time. As it is, building is suspended and the church has had to rearrange its plans. Mornings at 11, evenings at 6.30, the church adds that all free churchmen will be welcome. Mrs. Height, one of 37 founder members of the new church in Goring, recalls some of her memories. During the early part of the war, I was a member of Shelley Road Choir. Worthing Corporation offered it the use of Elm Grove School as a place of worship for those of us living in Goring. The first service was held there on Sunday the 4th of August 1940 and was conducted by Mr Young of Lansing. About 35 attended and we sat on those canvas chairs. Mr Young, by the way, was chairman of the Shelley Road Extension Subcommittee. My son Edward was the first baby to be christened there. There weren't many evening services because of the blackout. But when they were held, they were held in one of a group of three detached houses in Goring Road. They have long since been gone now, and shops stand in their place. Mr Bold and Mr Humphrey were ministers at the time. Mr Humphrey was our first permanent minister. He and Mrs Humphreys were a dear couple. You know before he died in hospital in 1947, he said just two words, be loyal. Official recognition to Goring Congregational Church was given on June the 14th, 1947. Building work for a new church began in the spring of 1948. The Worthing Herald recorded pictures of the laying of the foundation stone. Gifts that were given included the communion table with four matching chairs and the pulpit. The new church opened on March the 1st, 1949. Three weeks later, two memorial boards were unveiled on the north wall. The Reverend Springbett, minister between 1950 and 1953, writes of his time in Goring. 1950. My stipend was somewhat less than seven pounds a week with no allowance for expenses and, of course, no car. 
All my visiting was done on foot, by bicycle or on public transport. There was no washing machine or freezer, no television and no colour photography. When I arrived there were some 90 members on the church roll, that number rising to some 135 by the time I left in the summer of 1953. The Children's Hall, or East Hall, as it is now known, was built at the end of 1950. In 1954, the Reverend Cyril Franks and his wife Joan were welcomed to the ministry. Which was uh, red and blue strips. I think the red predominated. The red was in the centre and blue on either side, or the other way around. Um, and although it sounds outrageous, it really didn't work out like that. It was really quite pleasant. And uh, I can remember the winter evenings, especially when the lights were shining, how it was a welcoming sight to them. So that, that was one of the impressions of that. Yeah, I mean, the church itself was sort of out, out in the country, certainly on the edge of the, edge of the country, and a lot of the area around wasn't developed. I forget the name of the area. But north of the bridge, um, fields of corn. But it was a growing community. I mean, the people came to church very largely because it was the only church in the neighbourhood. Um, it wasn't where you had to fight to get people to come to church. They just came. I remember people coming, actually. I remember early Monday coming and coming along with his membership certificate. The first Sunday he appeared, he said, Hello, I'm Mr. Monday. I come from Watford. And here's my transfer certificate, you know. <laughs> You said something earlier on about people queuing up to come into church. Oh, indeed, yeah. they had to queue up. That, um, you see, it, it says in the record that it was 200 seats, but that, I think, must include the number on the platform, and that was occupied by the choir. I always say it was about 180. And uh, in order to get in, that they just had to queue up, um, first come, first serve, and to be able to um, find a seat mm. and to get a seat. And eventually came the time when we felt that we just had to build a new church. I mean, on a number of occasions we had to have two morning services, um, festival times especially. And Mr. Winwood was called in from Southampton to be our architect, and he designed the present building. for the glory of God and that's one of the reasons why the pillars taper from smaller to larger as they, as they go up to represent uplifted hands. It was one of the members whose name is still known amongst you, Mr Cornwall, who commented to me and I pass this on to the architect that straight lines were given for strength and curved lines for beauty and he couldn't see any curved lines in the church and, and that is why he did put just this one curved line in which you'll see at the front of the I don't know what you call it platform rostrum uh, that kind of an area. Uh, Mr. Silverston used to travel by train from well he commuted to town and he saw in Coulston south of Perth he saw a cross on the top of St Andrew's church from the train yeah, and he said that's what we want for our church and he was an electrical engineer specialist in that particular field and it was Ken Silverstone's idea that we put a, an illuminated cross on the top. Yeah. And so the new church was opened on Saturday September the 16th 1961. The choir wearing their gowns for the first time and joined by Shelley Road Church choir members, waited outside while the door was unlocked by the Reverend H. A. Hamilton, the chairman of the Congregational Union of England and Wales, who also preached the sermon. Um, H. A. Hamilton, yeah. when he was preaching on the... H. A. H. A. 
when he was preaching uh, at the opening of the church and he said he started off by saying let there be light <laughs> what's light <laughs> The plate glass doors I have just walked through represent the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. All these symbolic panels were made by Guilford Glass and Metal Works Limited, who are also responsible for much of the glass work in the Guilford Cathedral. The symbols at the lower part of the door to St Matthew was given the cherub. To St Mark was the lion, because he has set forth the royal dignity of Christ. St Luke has the ox, because he has dwelt on the priesthood of Christ, the ox being the emblem of sacrifice. And finally, St John has the eagle, which is the symbol of the highest aspiration because he soared upwards to the contemplation of the divine nature of the Saviour. A feature of our church are the echelon windows on either side. On the west side, the stained glass panels represent the life of Christ. the east side of the church signify the life of the Christian. The body of the church is 46 feet wide and 61 feet long, the transepts being 18 feet wide and 13 feet deep, altogether accommodating a congregation of about 350. The ceiling of the church is lined with strip boards of clear hemlock and the main roof, which is copper covered, is supported by the front and rear walls and four precast portal frames, the arches of which weigh six tons. chapel was formed in the mid-1970s soon after the Reverend William Connolly commenced his ministry at this church. It is used at 8 a.m. on Sunday mornings for the service of Holy Communion and on the third Sunday of each month in the evening there is the ministry of healing and the laying of hands. Also there are various private uh, prayer meetings here and on New Year's Day there is a vigil which is organised by Mrs Irene Tuley. We have the Book of Remembrance and also the prayer book. I would like to mention the Brass Cross. Under the leadership of the Reverend Maurice Bold in 1941 Number three, Goring Road was brought into use. The army's consent having been attained, this was opened as a house of quiet for servicemen. One of the upper rooms was converted into a beautiful little chapel, furnished with a simple communion table, draped in rich blue velvet, and adorned by the little brass cross, which has ever since been in use at the Barrington Road Church. The picture of the Last Supper was presented by Worthing Congregational Church, who also gave the land on which this church stands. Mm -hmm. 
certain, I'm not certain whether you can actually read this, but the inscription is to the loving memory of the Reverend F. J. H. Humphrey DSO, this table was presented to Goring Congregational Church by his devoted wife and family. The choir stalls are in a burra and agbird wood, whilst the rest of the woodwork in the church is oak. Now I would like to read an inscription on one of the choir stalls. These racks were presented to the church in loving memory of Phyllis Parker. She found great joy in music. The lectern was presented to the church by the Freeman family. The inscription reads in grateful memory of John Whiteman Freeman, who was killed during the Second World War on May the 25th 1944. To the glory of God, this pulpit was presented by Mrs. Height in memory of her beloved husband, Edward A. H. Height. Between 1949 and 1961, the pulpit was in the church hall where our services were held. But in 1961, we transferred it into the new church and the pulpit had to be considerably enlarged. This organ, installed by Henry Willis and Son Limited of London, was provided by the gifts of members of this church and congregation assisted by a generous donation from Worthing Congregational Church. This organ was originally built in the early 1930s for his own personal use by the vicar of a village in Hertfordshire. It was then rebuilt, more or less as it is now, in 1958, and then shortly after the death of its previous owner, it was bought by Henry Willis, the organ builders, from whom the church then purchased it, ready for installation at the opening ceremony of the present building. One extra stop was added to the final list and the organ as it is now has seven speaking stops to each of the two manuals. On the upper manual or keyboard, the swell, there is an open diapason stop. A Lieblich Gedeckt, which is a flute stop. A string stop, the viola de gamba, and a voix celeste, which is specially tuned to be very slightly out of tune with that stop, and produce that beating, vibrating effect. The fugara is pitched an octave higher than the other four stops. The fifteenth an octave higher still, and finally the trumpet stop, the characteristic English full swell organ sound can be produced by adding a sub octave coupler so that all those three speaking stops sound at their own pitch and an octave lower as well to produce this effect.
as you can hear, the whole of this section is encased in a box so that with the aid of a foot pedal which opens and closes shutters in front of the pipes a wide variety of volume can be obtained. the grate has two open diapason stops the second of which is noticeably louder than the first the stopped diapason is another flute character stop Dulciana is a quiet accompaniment stop. The principal is again pitched an octave higher. The Nazard was the new stop that was added to the organ and can be used in combination with the stopped diapason. To produce a, a clarinet tone. And the flagellet finally is a quiet stop pitched two octaves higher, which can be added to some of the other stops to produce the characteristic English organ tone. The pedal section has just three speaking stops, the open diapason, board on, and a bass flute. Here first is the open diapason. The board on. The bass flute. But these can be amplified considerably by adding some of the stops from the manuals. For example, if we add stops from the great keyboard, and from the swell keyboard, fuller sound can be produced. Here are two short extracts to demonstrate some of those stops. First of all, a piece called Tocatina for the Flute Stop by Pietro Jon, which demonstrates the two flute tone stops, the Lieblich Gedacht from the Swell and the Stop Diapason from the Great Keyboard, and then the well-known trumpet tune by Henry Purcell to demonstrate the trumpet stop.
finally, to demonstrate the full organ effect, the end of Max Reger's Toccata in D minor. Reverend Cyril Franks stayed in the new church for only two years before leaving to take up a new ministry in Purley. After an interim period of two years, the church at Goring called the Reverend Wallace Hayward. Mrs. Marjorie Hayward lives in retirement in this delightful spot in Kent. She was only too pleased to recall Wallace's ministry. Wallace and I spent 10 very happy years at Goring URC. When we arrived in 1964, we found a very warm welcome and all through our 10 years with you, we were surrounded with love and friendship and help. Wallace, as all through his life, was very interested in the caring for young people. And whilst we were there, the Boys' Brigade, the Girls' Brigade and the Youth Club were three of his great interests. He was also involved in purchasing a house for the elderly people and was very much touched when they named it after him. I understand all the flats are very much in use now. One of my interests was the Women's Guild where I had many friends and very good helpers. However, I did upset them all one day, I remember. I was taking the opening prayer and thinking of all the good things God has given us. I thanked him for the beautiful flowers and the lovely trees, the glorious sea and the coastline, the sun and the rain. And then, I thought, the wind does good too. So I thanked him for the wind. The members of the Guild, having had a lot of experience with the high and sometimes destructive winds of Goring, with one accord all groaned loudly. Perhaps I deserved it. I should like to say a very big thank you for all the happiness that you gave us during our time with you, and to wish you God's blessing for the next 50 years. Three founder members, Mr C. Cornwall, Mrs. A. Thomas and Mr. G. Nodes were all elected to the office of Life Deacon, the highest honour of Congregationalism. The church continued to grow and it was becoming apparent that some extension to the premises was necessary to accommodate the developing needs of the various organisations meeting week by week. A development committee was formed and a new room planned, sited between the church and the main hall. In 1966, Mr Cornwall died and left a generous legacy to the church. It was agreed that since his first love 
had always been for the children, this legacy would be used for building this new room for their use. It could now go ahead without delay. The Cornwall Room was opened on March the 12th, 1967, by Reverend Wallace Hayward. An amalgamation was made between the Congregational Church of England and Wales and the Presbyterian Church of England. The United Reformed Church was thus formed in 1972. Wallace and Marjorie Hayward retired and moved to live near their daughter in Kent and it wasn't long before news came that Wallace had died. The Reverend William Connolly was called to the church and was inducted as minister on the 2nd of August, 1974. Well, the routines and rhythms of any minister in any church are bound to differ according to the kind of work that the church expects of him, the kind of work which he thinks that he can do best, and the kind of demands that are made by God upon his life and upon such talents and gifts as he may by the Holy Spirit possess. And so when I came here in 1974 I had to learn a number of things about this church and about the people who live round about it. The first thing that I wanted to do was to offer what they call a kind of maximum exposure, that is to say that I wanted to be as available as possible to meet the needs of people here in the church and to meet the needs of people there outside in the community. And that's a funny word because when you come to think about it, probably we don't live in communities much at all. We simply live amongst masses of people. And so I learned that it would be far better for me to concentrate in the early mornings at home upon one's devotional and prayer and study life, there in the fairly early hours of the morning to do that reading and writing of sermons and preparation for talks which we have to do if we are to be able adequately to fulfil the work that comes throughout every day. And so the first couple of hours or so in the morning are spent at home and then I try to be here at nine o'clock. Hilary, who is the minister's assistant, is nearly always here first and so we're assured of a good welcome. We then begin with prayer and anybody else who is around in the church will be invited to join in our prayers. And not infrequently during the prayers we find that we're interrupted by someone knocking on the door or else the telephone ringing. And so we've learned, and I think we've learned it from the New Testament, because if you study our Lord's life in the New Testament, his seemed to be a life where he was being constantly interrupted. But instead of being disturbed, distressed, put out or made angry by the interruptions, he was able to turn them all to good account. Many people who telephone are in distress. They need a word of encouragement, a word that says, we still love you even though maybe you don't think so. By the way, I took a funeral this afternoon, I took two funerals this afternoon, and following one of them, somebody gave me a kiss. It's one of the rare times when following a funeral, somebody has come forward and given me a kiss. That must have been the kiss of peace. 
The day when my sister said that my mother hadn't... William finds little time to spend in his garden with his wife Mary, as her work as a school teacher takes her to London, where life is very different. The right way up. That's upside down, Yarrow. You've got to start at nothing and count upwards. Can Fire, just put the... What do you do with this? No, you don't measure the leaf. What's my do? The junior church has approximately 80 children covering all ages up to about 15. They enjoy their worship together and in their departments. Year, they work through the Bible exploration, which has replaced the old scripture examination. The babies up to three years old are catered for in the creche. From three to five years, there is the beginner's department. The five to seven year olds meet together in the primary department. <laughs> The oldest group meeting together is the Bible class. May not die, but have eternal life. Right, now Andrew, if you'd like to do your verse nice and slowly so that we can all hear it. The Lord placed his throne in heaven. He is king over all. Right, now I'll finish with, Arise Jerusalem and shine like the sun. The glory of the Lord is shining on you. Now today's Remembrance Day. The junior church leader is Mrs. Carol Davis.
Party time is a highlight for the children and young people every year when a program is put together by the staff for three separate parties. Bible class and youth club, juniors and the beginners and primary. The ladies of the Monday Evening Fellowship come in to provide all the refreshments. The Girls and Boys Brigades are an essential part of the life of the church and the captains talk about life in the companies. I happened to be the fifth captain of Fifth Worthing. The company was formed in 1953 by Mrs Dorian Blackman and followed three others then until I came along and took over the company on the 1st of January 1972. And I'm a lucky lady. I've had all those years of great pleasure leading the girls. At the present moment we've 65 girls on the books, ranging in age from 5 upwards to 19. They come in four sections, the 5 to 8s being the explorers, the 8s to 11s being juniors, 11s to 14s being seniors and the 14s and overs being brigaders. All work is done under a fourfold programme of subjects from spiritual, physical, education and service. At the present moment, they're busy in the junior section doing care of pets. And in the senior section, they are doing craft work, making some small wishing wells out of clothes pegs. They've also been making bird seed cake for the garden, for the birds in the winter time. And after Easter, the older girls will be starting on some, sp uh, sp some spiritual work, namely making a book ready to place in the vestibule in time for the church's anniversary. The aim of the Girls' Brigade really is to bring girls to the knowledge and love of the Lord Jesus. And so part of every company night is given over to the spiritual side of our teaching, because for some girls, especially those who don't even come to our junior church, this may be the only Christian teaching they get in their young lives. And I suppose the highlight of every year is the company camp. We've been camping each year since 1975 and we've been to such places as Felixstowe, Bedford, Woodford on the edge of the Epping Forest, Bournemouth, Bath, Edenbridge, Holland and Switzerland. And this year we're off to France with the older ones and back to our favourite spot in Bournemouth with the young ones.
been with the Fifth Worthing Company of the Boys Brigade for quite a few years now. In fact, started in 1962 as captain. The company is split into three sections. Company section being the senior section for boys from 11 upwards, probably 16 or 17. Then we have the junior section, and where we have boys from 8 to 11. And then of course the anchor boys section, that is for boys from 5 and a half, 6 to 8. The anchor section is run by Mrs Eileen Rhodes with the help of Alison Sopp and Bobby Hitchin. The junior section is once again Alison Sopp, myself and Malcolm Nichols with the help of Colin Easy on occasions. In the company section it's mainly Mr Nichols and myself we're in the company section. We deal with all kinds of things in the company section, mainly dealing with badge work of one sort and another. On the, this occasion we were doing camping. And then of course with juniors, life is a little simpler, though they work for what we term achievements. And also they have games and we have devotions. Then of course with the anchor section, even more simpler, with simple games and Bible stories. And generally we find the young boys in their red jerseys are very interested in the things they're asked to do. So have coffee mornings to raise funds either for ourselves or, or perhaps for some other project. On this occasion I think it was the, the holiday club where we raised £66 to help to pay for things that they needed at the holiday club. Appreciate help from parents and friends in running these functions. Looking back over the years, when we see a film of boys in the older type uniform, though we still retain the haversack, and also we camped at Jersey, and this is an activity you see at Jersey many years ago, about 30 years ago, in 1962. Young people also get together in a youth club to enjoy themselves on a Saturday evening. Ray and Val Close open their doors to the young people every Sunday evening after church and provide a warm welcome.
There are many ways in which the church family get together for recreation and study during the week. Starting with a jolly group for mothers and toddlers, the R. Good afternoon ladies and very welcome you are very nice to see you on this dull day and I hope that with your coming we shall find it will be an enjoyable day that's the important thing and um, I'm sure you've all seen this lovely tapestry that uh, Jean has started um, for the guild celebration 50th anniversary of the church well, you've all, have you all seen it now? No? Would you like to bring it down, Jean? Is it too awkward? <laughs> I believe the cost is going to be somewhere between 50 and 70 pounds. The, the walls are very expensive and that is with, um, with Mr. Marsh doing the, the frame. It will only be the glass for the frame. <laughs> we haven't got all the figures on yet. We haven't got all the figures on yet. It's as it it grows as we go out. We think of new things to put on. There's going to be, we hope, some uh, more people coming in this way. And there's going to be the uh, windmill at High Salmonton up here, we hope. There's going to be the downs. It's going to be the railway bridge, I hope, <laughs> and, uh, and the bridge up from the church here. And as I say, we get ideas and uh, uh, we put them in as we go. Because it's all lit up. The church is normally a very dark, you can't see where you're going, but on this occasion all the lights are on, it's all very bright, and all their best banners and things are brought out. And there's silver, all the lovely silver is on display. And of course they do carry round a statue of the Blessed Apostle. So that, that was got out and maybe up, brushed up. And, and then the procession. So we went outside the church. Thank you. Thank you for asking. And Thank you for drawing attention to the increase in the cost of the running of the church. He mentions the even the I'm not going to 
The church affairs also have to be attended to and the elders of the church meet together every month for prayer and discussions on financial matters, pastoral work, buildings and church growth. That in our beginnings and endings that we may so praise you as to know your presence among us and by your presence may we be healed, blessed and inspired the better to serve you here in your church, in our homes and throughout the neighborhood. And to God the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be glory and praise forever. Amen. 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 The monthly church meetings Follow the elders' meetings. Christian outreach is also a concern of the church. Fifty years ago, this church was the subject for outreach in the minds of members of Shelley Road Congregational Church. An outreach to the new Durrington community occupied the minds of the members at Goring. In 1978, the Reverend R. Christopher joined the church. He was asked to lead a team which could consider forming a new church in West Durrington. For some years, the Goring United Reformed Church had been concerned about a Christian witness in the area of Darrington. 
which was then developing. In 1979, I was appointed to come and help Reverend William Connolly and to be the associate minister in our church with a special brief from our church meeting and from the Synod to look at Durrington. Eventually, through the Worthing Borough Council, the building was erected on a corner of Tesco's car park in New Road and the official opening was attended by Princess Alexandra. Here again, uh, some little while since I came to lead the worship here. You're glad to know I'm very fit and flourishing, and very happy in my new home at Lamas House. Uh, I have a very nice room with the beautiful view of the garden, so I'm very well settled. leads morning worship, practices on Friday evenings, and is led by one of the six organists, Mr. Haffenden. in the church throughout the year is reflected in pictures from Christmas time. How it was a welcoming sight to them. So that, that was one of the impressions of that. <laughs> so Worship in the church throughout the year is reflected in pictures from Christmas time through to harvest.
theme of this week, and the work will continue for about one week. May I also remind you of the elders' election and the need for that the chief treasure to be left behind at the end of our age, whatever that will mean, it will mean Christ's fulfillment. To think that a forsaken grave is our chief treasure is holy to misunderstand. In its power, so we, where we never so vile nor simple, may still receive from a living Lord, not only a glimpse, not only a touch, but as we repent and come to Him, we are embraced in His life.